Hello everyone. Welcome back to the Craft and Business of Books with me, Tatiana Denford. And I'm Marissa Hazy. So this is the show that gives you the tools, the tricks, the stumbling blocks to the writing process. But also Marissa and I are trying to give you guys the behind the scenes uh, perspective from the industry side. We're going to give you perspective of author's processes and everything in between. So we're trying to make the book world a little bit less scary. We are on every Friday at 2 p.m. Eastern, so make sure to click the link below to subscribe to be alerted ahead of every episode. Right, today is super exciting because what are we talking about? We are talking about writing own voice. Um, so own voice is defined right, as writing a story about a marginalized group of people where you are part of that marginalized group, right? As opposed to someone who has not had that lived experience and is writing from that group's perspective. Um, well, over the last year, you know, we've seen more and more narrative fiction emerge on the immigrant experience, both own voice and otherwise. These stories in the format of memoir have been almost entirely absent. Uh, so our guest today has said in an interview before that she began writing her book as fiction, um, but ultimately decided not to tell her story that way. And I'm so curious about how, you know, as a writer, you start on that path and then, you know, how a change of heart happens. Yeah. I mean, we covered memoir in a previous episode, and I think, you know, it's both equally cathartic as it is really frustrating and unnerving because you're basically peeling away the layers of your own story and you're you are putting it out there in a very public way um you know so that and then if you add layers of an immigrant story and i'm i'm the daughter of immigrants so these stories to me are what makes the world turn i mean you know these are stories that are like clothes that are passed down from generations and I think, you know, this in particular, you know, Ziva's book kind of deals with an immigrant story, a marginalized upbringing, you know, and also it has feminist themes. So she covers a lot of bases in such a raw and honest and beautiful way. And I'm from the creative side. I'm really curious as to how, how somebody approaches that, how someone handles that and, you know, with so much grace. But also, how do you you know, find that path in an industry? How do you work with your team in order that that story comes across in a really authentic, but also, you know, not in an aggressive way? Do you know what I mean? Like, it, it has to be so delicate, but also really powerful. And I think that's that's what I find really compelling. Yeah, definitely um, compelling and frustrating, I'm sure. Uh, I think, it, you know, I, I would suggest that uh, getting publishers on board, you know, both in the US and the UK, with telling immigrant stories has not been a smooth road. <laughs> um, we talk a lot about commercial viability here, right? And, you know, up until recently, publishers really had their heads in the sand on what would sell and who was buying books and who yeah. they publish books for. And, you know, it created an immensely restrictive environment, you know, that feels like it's finally opening up. I say all of this with, you know, I, I'm sure, you, you know, you can hear in my voice, it's, it's quite reticent because I'm, I'm reluctant to give credit <laughs> um, because I think it's, it should have, you know, it should have, should have happened already. Yeah, it's a work in progress, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so I am curious uh, about books like, like our guests also being turned down before, like how, how many, how many books like this were turned yeah. down before we got to this point? Yeah. Um, you know, were the stories actually not being told? Were they not being submitted? <laughs> you know, of course, I, I think I, I find it very difficult to believe. So um, I think it's it's such a it's such a difficult such a difficult hurdle right yeah. now. Um, so anyway, I am glad that obviously publishers are are moving on things like this, and they are beginning to open up their their minds and the workplace itself about you know about different stories than they, they've spent the last hundred years publishing. Um, it's, 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 I don't want to, I'm not patting anybody on the back. <laughs> no, no and quite rightly so. And I think, you know, to those of you who um, I'm sure many of you have, you've heard about it, you've probably read it, but to those of you who haven't, um, my past as a foreign country is Ziba's memoir on growing up um, as an Indian Muslim in Saudi Arabia and her quest for freedom for you know, strength of her own narrative through education in India, Germany, and England. Um, Ziva's honest and raw and really compelling storytelling, it just made it made me feel like I was having a heart-to-heart -heart conversation with a friend. 
you know, it was very descriptive. It was, it had so many elements where, like, I think a lot of people could take from that, not only kind of how they feel about their own life, but in particular about how they feel about their own family stories and kind of digging into that and asking more questions about why these stories aren't, you know, being celebrated more. Um, you know, I can feel her in, you know, in the text, I can feel her concern, her fear, her sorrow, her happiness, you know, they're all equal. So, um, yeah, so uh, I'm sure she's getting very embarrassed that I'm I'm talking about her like this, like she's not here, so let's bring her on. <laughs> Hello, Ziva. <laughs> so, Ziva, I'm gonna introduce you now um, while you awkwardly watch. That's what we do here. Um, so, <laughs> your your memoir, My Past is a Foreign Country, was published by Scepter, right, in the UK last summer. Um, and it's so unique for covering the amount of topics that, you know, that Tatiana uh, referenced earlier that you've had come together in your life, you know, including feminism and hair loss and generational divides, and prejudice and more. Uh, so thank you so much for coming to talk with us today. Thank you so much for having me. That's great. So we always, we always start the show, firstly, um, with kind of current affairs. So what are you working on right now? Um, you know, especially now that we're all stuck at home, we're trying to be a bit more productive or not. So just yeah. curious as to what you have going on. So I'm making my third attempt at my second book, I guess, a fiction project. And I'm finding that I used to write fiction before I wrote my memoir, and then I moved to nonfiction. And now I'm trying to get back into fiction. And I do genuinely feel like I've forgotten how to write fiction or how to create, because there were so many questions um, that were so important to me while I was writing the memoir about my intention mm -hmm. and what is my story to tell? What can I share? How can I share it? and thinking and writing and exploring real life so closely mm -hmm. has now made it impossible, I think, almost. But I need to relearn how to imagine again and how to give myself and my characters and my voice that permission to just look beyond real life. Mm -hmm. um, I'm finding that quite interesting. I did not anticipate this. I didn't think that this would be an issue. I thought I'd just slip right back into the things that I used to love doing. and. Uh, enjoyed. Uh, but yeah, it's been quite a journey back, I think, finding myself as a fiction writer. Do you think, because you're playing around with fiction now, do you think you're learning how your voice has changed or is changing? You're kind of manipulating it in a way? Are you learning more? Or are you digging deeper? How does that feel? Definitely all of that. And I feel like when you're not a published author, people don't have opinions about your voice. And mm. now I feel like I'm writing, having read some reviews about people talking about how they find my style and my language and my use of uh, certain words. And I find that quite interesting. The intention with the memoir was always to um, tell my story but in a way that I speak and the way that I know women like me speak. Mm -hmm. And the idea was always, they are my audience. And it was the having my book out there was also about having a book out there for these women to find themselves in the book. So I was very clear from the beginning that I didn't want to write in a way that I see other writers that I love and admire write. I wanted it to be very similar to the way I speak. So I think that helped me because that instantly that you know what your style is and then you go with that and you try to be very honest and I kept it very clean and I feel like I didn't spend as much time on the language I just didn't give myself permission to and there was no time yeah. as well and the, the focus remained on the stories um, and I spent a lot of time wondering how that would be received more than the language itself <clears throat> and I think when you're a fiction writer now I find some things have worked in my book and I feel really good. I feel confident that I can use that first person again, which is good good to know because I I guess when you have something a work out there which is loved, um, you can build on that. And I feel like that confidence is really helping me explore my future writing. I'm very grateful for it. Yeah. Uh, but it's also very easy to forget. I think when you're sitting in front of your current draft and it's really, really bad, it's very easy to forget that you're able to write or that you, in the past you have written anything good. <laughs> so there's also that. Um, there's definitely less sympathy from uh, people around me, whether it's like, oh, you've done it once, so 
Yeah, <laughs> that's a that's a recurring theme with authors that we've had. It's like you know, suddenly second book, even third book or more, you always get to that point with each book going. Can I actually write? Yeah. Book? Like, how did I do it the first time or the second time? Like, I don't think I have a book in me. This will kill me. <laughs> <laughs> yes, all no. of that. Yeah. Uh, just the other day, I was telling my husband, you know, maybe I'm just a uh, one book author and I'm okay with that. I'm fine. And then the next day, I was, he was like, what are you doing? I was like, I'm writing my book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's very up and down. Yeah. Now, do you, um, what do you, find for inspiration is there like what makes you say i'm going to sit down and kind of develop this idea or this is great is it music is it people is it you know newspaper articles where do you kind of where do you go for me it's art galleries and museums mm -hmm. um and i'm so grateful to be living in london and i think obviously before the lockdown i took it for granted like everyone um i really i think i'm the only person i know personally that enjoys commuting um, I love the tube. I, I look forward to commuting. I am not a morning person and I would struggle to get out of the house. But until I got to the station, I was like, oh, why am I doing this? Why is this my <laughs> life? And the moment I got to the station, I'd be so happy to be around and see the same people. We never spoke, but there were stories and journeys. And I don't know, I felt like a lot. Um, I was very inspired every day from being out and about, from meeting uh, my friends to spending time around colleagues. Um, and I worked uh, just next to the British Museum. So that was a very lovely area to be around. There were lots of events after, lots of small galleries doing amazing uh, stuff. So I think when we went into lockdown, um, I thought, oh, I have so much time now. Uh, I'm not commuting and I'm not meeting people. So this is perfect. I'm just going to start writing. And then immediately realized that that's not how my writing brain works and I, I just need um, some ideas and you know the way people speak the way people dress and just realizing that that's that was a huge part of my yeah. writing yeah people watching is such a fascinating thing I'm a huge fan of it only because you know I before I lived in um, in the UK I, I'm a New Yorker so you just sit outside and just, I could watch people all day. And actually, one of the things, um, it's funny that you say you mentioned like galleries help because my favorite, favorite museum ever is the Portrait Gallery uh, in London. And when I was writing, because I started writing my book when I was living in the UK, I would go in there and just walk around and I would get so many ideas just by looking at faces, just how to describe faces and certain energies and what they feel like, what they look, you know, so I, I completely get what, where you're coming from. Yeah, the portrait gallery is amazing. There's a portrait of Fiona Shaw in there. And I sometimes I just go just to see her portrait, spend some time there, maybe 30 minutes, an hour. And yeah, just that one face is enough for me, I find. And yeah, that gallery is amazing. Um, so talk to, talk to us about, um, <clears throat> now that we know kind of where you get your ideas, when you know that a book is coming out, like coming out of you, what is your routine? What is your process? Do you have a specific way you plot? Do you carve out certain times? Is it early mornings, late nights? I mean, obviously, uh, my past is a foreign country. You know, it was your story, but still, you had to probably find a way to do it. So how did that, how does that come about? There was a lot of, yeah, um, people often assume that the story is written chronologically, what hap whatever happens first comes first. And um, in fact, I was also surprised by the amount of time it took uh, to give it structure, to create a plot, to create drama into yeah. real life. And yeah. by that, I don't mean adding things or uh, embellishing it in any way, but the way it's written, the same story um, is being told in many different ways or can be told in many different ways. Um, I work full time. Uh, I work in production and publishing. Um, and the only way I could make time to write was before work, sometimes at lunch breaks, if I already knew what needed to be written. So at lunch times, so I would just have notes from morning where I've done all the plotting and planning and uh, setting intention for the stuff that I wanted to share. Um, I think that really helped. And also evenings and weekends. So any time when I wasn't working, and for a while I was wondering if maybe I needed some time away from work and I did take uh, some unpaid leave around the time I had my deadlines. Um, and I found that I could not work 
without work, without yeah. having my daytime uh, job. And I found that very interesting because as a writer, you imagine that all you need and all you want is that endless stretch of time. Yeah. But once it started, I couldn't imagine anything worse. And I wasted that entire time that I had. I think I just watched Netflix endlessly, <laughs> didn't get any writing done. And again, at the last day, I was like, oh my God, I have so much to do. And I feel like my writing comes from that place of, I wouldn't say panic, but mm -hmm. I think a lot of writing happens in our minds. Um, I love doing chores around the house. And I feel like when I'm washing uh, up or cleaning the dishes. And in the background, it bubbles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, and I feel like I don't give that process enough credit. So I'm doing a lot of work in my head. But also there's a lot of self-loathing, like, oh, you should be writing and you're not writing and you never write and you waste time. Do you even want to be a writer? So there are all these negative thoughts going on as well. So I think now I realize the importance of spending time with your characters and with your book in your mind, in your life, yeah. uh, but just letting it embrace you fully. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel like, of course, there is a lot to be said about turning up and sitting down and writing, which is the toughest thing. Um, and I know as writers, um, I'm also uh, guilty of this. We find all kinds of excuses oh, and we intellectualize yeah. the whole situation and we're like, oh, no, I'm doing all the writing in my head. But, you know, so I think there has to be a balance uh, of both. And I feel like reaching that balance is quite interesting. But work um, away from my writing, I think really helps me stay focused. I, I'm, and also, it's such a difficult time to be a writer. It's such a difficult time uh, in this economy to be a full-time writer. And I, I think I'm not a person who would be able to work with that kind of anxiety about paychecks and money and yeah. and I feel like especially in the UK I don't know how it is in the US um, I don't think writers a lot of writers even get living wage it's not a possibility no, no, no but that's that's across the board you know that, yeah. that's not and I think the more people understand that I think the assumption is oh great you make it you know there's always there's a running theme in our show which is you have an agent, that's it. You're done, you can quit everything and just kind of, what did Virginia Woolf say? A room of one's own. Yes. So I, I secretly think that sometimes she sat around and just ate chocolate and just <laughs> stared, uh, stared out the window. So. <laughs> I agree. But, you know, I think realistically, I think, you know, 90% of writers have to have second jobs, third jobs. They can't, you know, it's, I, I would like to demystify the notion where, you know, people are saying, I've made it, where's my money? You don't write to get the giant advance or the paycheck. You write because you just feel compelled to write. You'll have to work it around lunch breaks. That's what I did. You have to work it around getting up at five in the morning for the kids or like writing after they go to bed. All of that, I think, you know, it's amazing that if you really want to do it, that's what you're saying. Like, you just have to put the pieces into place. You can't just sit around and expect people to throw money at you while you while you write. <laughs> no, definitely. And I don't know if it's because I'm trying to, my mind is trying to be positive about the whole thing, but I do find that my work and meeting people and having a place to go to adds so much value to my writing. I feel like I learned so much from my colleagues, from my authors, uh, from other people that I work with, editorial, and sure. that does add a lot. I feel like if I was left to my own devices, I think my writing would be a lot stagnant as well. Yeah, which, which is why I do the show with Marissa, because she's basically my personal trainer and just it encourages me <laughs> to kind of keep thinking about the industry side, which is, you know, why she's she always has the, the best questions. So I'll pass her over to you now. Oh, very, very yeah. good. <laughs> um, so I, I read, and I mentioned this earlier, that I, I read in an interview that you did that you had considered fictionalizing the story first, right? And then tried to write that version a few times. You know, can you tell us why it didn't feel right ultimately? And, you know, you then decided to come to it as a memoir. Yes, um, I think the writing didn't feel powerful mm -hmm. and it didn't serve the purpose of what I needed my memoir to give me. And I feel um, at the point of writing and when I set the intention to write this book, mm -hmm. the idea was to free myself and I write about my hair loss and um, uh, right now I'm wearing a lace front wig and mm -hmm. in the past these were things that I had to hide I was not allowed to share um, all 
anything that I was feeling or I was not allowed to go away from the script of the patriarchy within my community. Um, and I felt like by fictionalizing it, I was not doing myself justice. I was not doing my story justice and I was not giving it the space it deserved. And also the idea was that by writing it, I'm freeing myself and by putting it on paper, I'm letting everyone around me know that I'm not ashamed and I've got nothing to hide and I can be free of the burdens mm -hmm. and I don't have to carry it with me anymore. And I felt like fiction just wasn't doing it for me. It just yeah. didn't feel powerful enough. It, it, it felt like I was, the, I was trying to say, embrace yourself, but I was still hiding behind a fictional character. Right. So it felt a bit hypocritical um, as well. So it became really important to me to speak in my own voice and to take, um, I feel like a lot of people in my community, women especially, mm -hmm. they don't have ownership over their stories. They don't have ownership over their lives. They don't have ownership over how they feel about themselves even, you know. The mm -hmm. patriarchy is such a huge part of our lives and yeah. invasive. Um, and I felt like this was something that I had to do not only for myself, but for all the women around me, for the women that I've come from, my ancestors, to to show them that I will speak and I will bear the brunt of whatever happens from speaking and right. I will live and I live my best life so you can see that this is possible and you don't have to be scared and I've got you. And I think it, will, it would have been impossible to do that with a fiction book. Sure. That's so amazing. Um, so we talk a lot about how your work can change right, as it moves through the publishing pipeline and how many people touch it. And, you know, when you get an agent, if, you know, your agent happens to have an editorial background, which often, often happens, you know, and how, how many iterations you go through. Um, and certainly, you know, you'll know that, obviously, as it's some worse in publishing, right? How, yeah. how, how, many, how many times that happens, even down to the point that, you, you know, that you're, that you're doing in production, yeah. you know, changing. Yeah. Um, so we've also talked about how with nonfiction or memoir or anything that draws a personal experience, right, this can be a really difficult, it can be a more difficult thing for a writer to, to move through. Um, you know, were there any amendments you were asked to make along the way that you pushed back on? Were there any times you felt you had to educate your publishing team on something so that they got it? Like, Yeah, um, I feel like maybe this is like my experience might be very different from the normal experiences that people from uh, my background would have because I I, um, I guess your viewers might know that nonfiction books are usually accepted on proposal, so you don't always have to have the entire draft ready. And I believe that that's because with nonfiction books, editorial and publishers, um, they like to have more input uh, in the books because they tend to be more current affairs and um, on, based on trends that are going on as well. Yeah. Um, so I pitched to my publisher uh, with a proposal and a 10,000 word sample. And the pitch was a collection of essays. So it was going to be three long essays and it was the book itself was going to be um, a book length essay. So it wasn't pitched as a memoir. Wow. So already you can see the huge wow. difference. Uh, um, and when I signed the contract, the contract was for writing um, up to 3,000, uh, 30,000 words. So it was going to be three essays. It was going to be about my mother, um, the patriarchy, and my hair loss, and just trying to connect the three together. Mm -hmm. And very quickly, my editor found that there was a lot more to explore. Mm -hmm. And she asked if I would double the word count. So I think of us as collaborators. We were in it together from the very beginning. And mm -hmm. from what I remember, this was her first memoir as well. Um, and I felt like we were both learning a lot from each other and from others uh, around us, as well as taking new ideas to each other. And I felt like the entire time that we were doing this uh, together. And for, for a long time, I used to call it our book. Um, and when the book was getting published, she said, uh, you need to stop calling it our book <laughs> when you talk to people about it. But I do think of it as mine and Francine's uh, book. Uh, and I feel like there's so many things that change. I personally did not have um, that issue where I needed to educate uh, my editor because I feel like she was really on board. She would do her own research and she would talk to people from my background. She has a very diverse uh, life herself. Mm -hmm. um, and I think these were all things that made her want to publish me in the first place. So I feel um, before that, when I was talking to people, talking to agents and um, editors, you can, I think you can tell when someone 
doesn't understand you or doesn't have the best intentions uh, with you. And that was the only thing I had in mind. I work in publishing, so I knew how difficult it was, but I also knew that my story deserved only the best and not in terms of the biggest editor or the best publisher, but a person who has the best intentions for my book. And mm -hmm. I think that makes such a huge difference. And you can yeah. you can tell that from the way the book is written because my voice is so clear and the, uh, the stereotypical bits that you see about Muslim women in books, um, you can see that it doesn't follow that path because no one forced me to follow that path. And also most importantly, I think with the cover, which is just so joyful. And when you look at the cover, you can't tell that it's a story uh, of a Muslim woman because I think before then, most of the Muslim women memoirs tended to have very stereotypical covers with their, um, I think, faces covered, or you could just immediately tell that this was a story of others. This is not a mainstream story. But I think my book cover um, just says like, oh, we are inviting this story into the mainstream. And you can, these are the things that you can tell. You can immediately tell what kind of team the book comes from mm -hmm. when you look at it, I think. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's um, one of the things that we talk we talk about a lot is just finding the right people, right? Yeah. To partner with and you know, making sure that you are doing all of the work that you need that you really need to do to make sure that the people you're working with are the people who are going to honor your story yeah. and publish it in the way that feels right to you and you know even if that's not the same as you thought when you set out, you yeah. know, you were going yeah. to do, but that it's, it continues to feel right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think, I think, um, I think Maris is frozen. Uh-oh. Um, I think almost especially with um, own story narrative, you need that kind of transparency mm -hmm. with the team around you because it lends strength to that voice in that story. You know, memoir is difficult enough as it is, I think, to delicately kind of, you know, um, get across. But own voice, immigrant stories, like you just need people who absolutely you know and you trust and you know they're going to position it in a way that in, is inclusive. It's not just, you know, what, what this book does for me, I think, it's, and I think it does for many people, is that it's not just one story somehow it just brings so many other stories together in this you know narrative and i think it's it's just wonderful but that team that team has helped that along which is amazing yeah definitely um so i am always curious about how time changes our perception on things right and particularly with with nonfiction. this you know this comes up i mean in fiction of course you know you have authors and you look back and you go oh god i wish i had done that <laughs> you know I, I, wish, I wish i had changed that, that character you know i mean geez i think with my son was that really the right name for him <laughs> um, so i am i'm wondering about how with some space now right between publication and now yeah a whole year yeah you know, book changed at all is there anything you wish you'd covered or light bulbs you've had since that you wish you know that you wish you would have covered really you know really what I'm trying to get as get at is you know again our perception of memory right changes yeah. and you know like and it evolves and you think about something today that you might think of differently a week from now so I'm just curious about how you how you think about what you you know what I think about. personally I have evolved a lot um in the last year but I would never, I wouldn't change anything in the book. And that's only because I spent so much time while I was writing the book. And before I started writing the book, I was very clear about my intentions for the book. Uh, but also, what do I believe in? What are things that I know will never change? Because, And also in the book I mentioned, and I believe this, the uh, precari uh, precarious nature of memory, like you can't trust memory and memories change. And when I look through my diaries, I've written down something and then what in the act of reading what I've written down things change in my head yeah. so it's so difficult to pin anything down and so my I didn't want to be in a place where I would look back years from now look at my book and then see that something was untrue or something was totally against what I stand for yeah. um, and because of that I didn't mention anything that I wasn't 100 percent sure about yeah. and even in my writing I'm very clear that these are my feelings mm -hmm. this is my perception of what happened yeah you know because the same incidents are viewed so differently 
uh, by different people. So at no point do I claim that I know everything and that this is the final version of whatever ha has transpired. And I think that's very important, especially when you write about people, because it's so difficult to write a memoir without including other people. And I've written a lot about my parents. Yeah. And I'm sure that there are bits in there that they don't agree with, mm -hmm. but they've been so graceful about my truth and my experience of their parenting. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that's really amazing. Um, I can't imagine reading things like that about myself and being, uh, you know, like not wanting to defend myself because that's, that's the world we live in. I think that's, that's human nature where we feel the need to defend ourselves. Okay. When I was writing, um, I was very careful about the stuff that I wanted to share and only the stuff that impacted me and had a huge impact on the path that my life took. Those were in the book. And there were lots of bits that I did want to write about, which I felt were not my story to tell, even though they impacted me. But they were things that were happening to other people. Mm -hmm. And it just didn't feel fair. And I feel like these are the choices you make as a nonfiction writer. And it's up to you. I feel like there's no right uh, or wrong way to do it. But once you make the choice, you have to stand behind it 100%. And I feel like I only took the chances that I felt that I could get behind. And which was a good thing because when the book came out, there were people who were unhappy with the book from within my family and not from places and people that I was expecting it from. I was quite ready to be able to explain myself about the stuff that I'd mentioned. Mm -hmm. But it was from people who were not directly in the book and it was the act of omission Right, right. That was also upsetting. And and then there are some things that I feel like some people uh, within my family had an issue with me mentioning the patriarchy itself mm -hmm. and calling me a liar because there was no patriarchy in my life. And I guess that's where you draw the line, where you understand that not everyone gets your story and not everyone wants to get your story. So these are these are very important questions. I feel like definitely the importance of exploring all of this, even before you reach a publisher or an editor is so important because you don't want to do things that you're not comfortable with because once the book is out there, it's out there. Yeah. And um, I think it's very easy for us as authors to get lost in the publishing process. It's very easy to get overwhelmed. Yeah. And I feel like my editor was really kind. Um, and I had so much help. So I don't have an agent, which was probably another thing um, that caused me a lot of anxiety. And I feel even when you have all the support, mm -hmm. being an author, and especially being an author of a personal book can be so overwhelming. And it's so important to have these conversations with yourself first uh, before you allow other people to direct where your book is going, because that's just unfair on yourself. Yeah, I think um, with the amount or with the ripple effect that this book has created, both kind of in your circle, but also like with, you know, in the world, you know, for so many people to kind of see how powerful the story is, would you write a, um, a nonfiction book again? Would you consider writing more stories of your life? Yes. Um, and only because before I wrote this book and before this book got published, I felt like this was the only story I had in me and I was very happy. Um, I was also very grateful to be able to get the chance to tell the story so early on in my life. Yeah. And I was quite at peace. I'm very happy in my publishing career. Um, and I feel like that's where also my mind is focused. So I feel quite content. Um, so when I wrote this book, there was um, I was okay with the idea that this would probably be my only book out there and that's completely fine um and just when i started getting uh people people like me people from families like mine people from um cities and patriarchal structures like mine getting in touch and sharing their stories and the impact that they have had has been very similar to the impact that a lot of my favorite writers have had on me especially when i was a kid and i feel like not as a burden, but just as a, oh, there are people who want something more from me. And what an honor. And um, it feels like a pleasure now to be able to write and to think, just knowing that the words had such an impact because the book was for me. The book was for me to be able to be free and live a lighter, happier mm -hmm. life. 
and then seeing that it's impacting so many people. And I think it's also put um, this thing in perspective, which I was always aware of having uh, been in publishing, but that there are so many people like me that I know, but only one book. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really motivated me as um, a publishing person to be able to to understand why there's not space for more stories mm -hmm. and why why am I the Muslim writer, Muslim feminist speaking for everyone right now? Yeah. So even though there's a lot of um, respect in it where I, I feel really good about being that representative, I want more people and more women to be standing beside me and more books like mine. Yeah. yeah. Great. I mean, what you've done with this book and the way you've described the process is I feel like you've created a widening circle of trust, isn't it? It's it's people saying, I'm trusting you with my story now. I, I, I feel like now, you know, you've opened the door for me that I can do this and I can share it. All we need is for the industry <laughs> To, yeah. listen, to listen to those voices saying, this is what we crave, especially now, right? I think kind of humanity is crying out or craving for mm. stories about people and learning about their cultures and their backgrounds and where they come from. It's about listening. So what this, you know, you're creating a dialogue. You're one of the many that are trying to. Yes. Yeah, yeah. definitely. And I think um, the audience and the readers have so much power and we don't we don't think about it or we don't talk about it as much or at least I was not aware of the decision making that readers do just the mm -hmm. kind of books that they buy the kind of audience yep. um, that they want to be and I think it's so important that readers are waking up to the idea of they can demand the books um, that they want mm -hmm. and I feel like right now it's such a good time to be a publisher and to be a reader and to be a writer because I think in the past maybe before technology like ours right now we could I think the publishers could pretend that they are catering to every voice mm -hmm. and now it's so much more difficult to be in denial because so many of us can just tweet at them and share and just you know go live on IG TV and I think that's so important and I feel like Publishers that are worth our time are listening and they're doing things that I think my publishers have been amazing, of course, but then there's so many independent mm -hmm. new publishers that are doing such amazing work and creating all these amazing stories um, and giving space to writers that we have, I think, in the past not have thought of as not worthy, that their story is not worthy. I feel uh, working class stories. Um, seeing them come out um, and the impact that they're having on their readers, I think that's so important. And in the past, this, that's a story that people don't give enough value to, but I, I'm finding that quite interesting now, yeah. So, I mean, I could keep, just keep talking to you for hours, um, but we're going to get into the fun questions. Not that that was interesting, but now we're going to kind of veer a bit over to a little bit of uh, trivia about you. Right, so I'd like to ask you, if you could do anything else other than what you're doing, so you're working, you're writing, you're happy doing it, if you could pick something to do for work that isn't that, what would it be? I joke about it, but I think it's true. I really want to work for the public transport i really want to work for the underground i love that, I love that. <laughs> lucky to have you. i oh just really God. want to be the person who helps people who is showing a lot of patience tells people where to go and you know just oh. being that point of contact i would really like that and i have uh, only been in london for a couple of years but yeah it's just been amazing the work that they do and the amount uh, that they bring to our lives uh, and just living in a city like this. Yeah. It's, it's tireless work, isn't it? And also you are literally facilitating someone's journey. You are saying, I'm gonna help you get from point A to point B. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like you're, in a way, I get it. Cause in a way it's like, you just wanna help continue people's stories. If they miss that train, it's like a sliding doors moment. Then mm -hmm. what happens? Then, you know, it's up to you, Ziba. You're part of that story. <laughs> I can't wait. <laughs> That's great. So we usually 
ask one of two questions, depending on whether you are an author or you are someone who works in the publishing industry. So lucky you. <laughs> Get both. So first, I'll ask the, I'll ask the, the, writing, the writing question or, you know, the, the you, as, you as a person question. Because <laughs> um, obviously, at being in publishing, you're no longer a real person. You know? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> so is there something that you could share about yourself or your writing process that might surprise people? There's a lot of crying involved. I just, I really don't want to be that writer, but there is a lot of crying. And I think in the middle of the first draft, or just after finishing the first draft, and I'd received the first round of corrections from my yeah. editor, yeah. I, I, I just started crying, even though the comments were great. And then I turned to my husband and I said, just make sure I never do this again. Ne never let me sign a publishing contract ever again <laughs> and there, there seems to be so much trauma around my writing and I I know lots of writers and I feel like not everyone thankfully has yeah. it that difficult so that is something I'm trying to actively change as well and I wonder if it's because it was a personal story and a lot of yeah. trauma came yeah. up um, and oh, reliving yeah. things so maybe it was that I hope it's that yeah oh no <laughs> it'll be fine <laughs> I hope <laughs> Um, do you want to do the other question, Marissa? Yeah, sorry. sorry, yes. <laughs> and then you, and then we can do the final question, which is, is much more fun. Um, so, what would you change about the public, the publishing industry, if you could snap your fingers? I would. I don't want to be the only brown person in the room that I work in. Mm -hmm. I think if I could change that, that's what I would change. Um, I'm very aware of this. I'm very aware um, that in the company that I work um, for the academic production division, I'm the only non-white uh, person in the room. Uh, and I feel like if I could change that very quickly, because there's so many conversations around it. And I feel like mm -hmm. we've been talking and talking and talking and talking for years, yeah. but the change hasn't manifested itself. Mm -hmm. So if I got that chance, I'd just be like, uh, more diverse people in the room. Yeah, yeah. It's it's a lot of talking and no action. And I think you know nowadays people um, are supported much more so in challenging that kind of behavior. So I think it's really exciting. And I'm hoping you know we're all we're all hoping you know that that will change. But I think now more than ever, people are like you know what. I'm not having it. And they're more willing to talk about it publicly, which is amazing. Yes. And I feel confident to be able to say this right now in this conversation as well. Yeah. Whereas at the beginning of my career, it felt um, not the right thing to do. Or I, I was just worried about how people yeah. would yeah. me and my own role would be in jeopardy, definitely. Of course. It's a difficult, I mean, it's a, it's a difficult thing because it's so deep rooted. Yeah. And yeah. It's, so it's like the starting point, if you try to start picking that apart, is so yeah. far. Yeah, you yeah. Know, you think about how why why did somebody like me want to be in publishing? You know, because I loved books growing up because I saw myself represented in books, or at least what I thought of, what I thought it was. Obviously, then I got older and I realized, you know, like I was <laughs> yeah, American. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> oh, but like, uh, it. See, I read books, you know, about women in publishing. You know, when I was in high school and, and, and college. So of course I was, I thought that was a valid career for me and that's what I wanted to do. If you don't see yourself represented in books from, you know, childhood. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and no one even part. knew how to get into publishing. And when I told my parents that that's what I wanted to do, um, they were not able to facilitate that because there was just no knowledge, um, yeah. especially in the families that I came from. And even now, I think maybe after my book came out, it feels different, but until that moment, every time it was like, what do you do? Or every gathering would be like, what do you do really? So <laughs> to be able to change that, yeah, yeah, definitely. So our last question uh, has been very difficult to answer for people. So uh, <clears throat> what's your desert island book? You're only allowed one. Ah, oh, that is so difficult. Um, every time I watch the Desert Island disc, I'm like, oh, what would be my I book? love that show. It's so amazing. Um, I would take the Quran because I've read it once and I only dip in and out of it. And I would take the Arabic and the English version. I can read the Arabic, but I don't understand it. And I think as a guidebook for a religion, um, 
it's so deep and it's so intense and it's so philosophical. Mm -hmm. um, I would love the time to be able to think about it more deeply and learn things from it, definitely. That's beautiful. That's a great answer. I, I, oh my goodness. Ziva, it's been an absolute pleasure having you here. I mean, we just, we loved it. It's Thank you. This is so good. Thank you. Wow. Thank you. You know, and it's, and I'm, I'm just amazed that you can, you know, so eloquently describe not just kind of your process and like the, your path and kind of in your writing, but also your story. And I think, you know, you've conveyed it in the book, but when you like, you just never know if you can really do that in person sometimes. I think people feel slightly probably awkward um, when they reveal more of themselves, especially face to face. So it's been an absolute treat. Thank you so much. Thank you again. Okay. Bye. Bye. Um, what can I say? I mean, I think, you know, from a creative standpoint, I think memoir, like we've said before, is just really, is really tricky. But, you know, when you are coming from a background that has a lot of complications mm -hmm. and has a lot of different stories, and she's been through a lot, and I think, for somebody to say, I am going to be the one that represents women who feel silenced and who feel like they can't share their story. That's so, and mm -hmm. people overuse this word, but it's brave. It's brave, yeah. and it's selfless, and it's strong. And I think, gosh, if we have more of that, and I think that changes the world. Yeah, I, I mean, I could talk to her for the next four hours and now ask about all of the individual topics that she covers in this book because I just, and, and all the things that she has said, right, that I've read that she's, you know, she's said about how she has come to think about certain things that she wrote about in the book. And I, it's just, it's like so much of it resonates from generational, you know, divides. I just, it's, uh, I think it was such an immense thing to take on um, in a book and she did it brilliantly. I think the lesson here is for like everybody watching, I mean, you know, we always kind of do a recap of the show. And I think this in particular, I think everybody just needs to understand how they ask for representation, mm -hmm. how they challenge what's happening in, in the industry now and how there's a lack of diversity. I think people need to try and feel brave enough to share their stories but also people need to support that as well. People need support systems and to say, you can do this, you need to do this, this is important, you know? I think these conversations really need to start happening. Yeah, absolutely. Or have been, but action, hello. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so thank you so much to everybody who watched today. Uh, remember we are on every Friday at 2 p.m. Mm -hmm. Eastern, so please click on the link to subscribe below to be uh, alerted of, ahead of every episode. I'm stumbling over my words because I'm way too excited about talking to Ziva today. But um, And thank you so much to everyone for being here. Yeah. See you next week. <laughs>